Hello and welcome to this Union Solidarity International Web Conference with Dr. Heiner Flassbeck. Dr. Flassbeck is former Deputy Finance Minister of Germany and currently Director of the Division on Globalization and Development Strategies at UNCTAD in Geneva. Uh, welcome, Dr. Flassbeck. Welcome, thank you very much. Um, we are hoping to speak to you today as part of a series that we've been having on uh, critical economics and uh, essentially the need to demystify the economic crisis that we face and to, to understand its roots. Uh, and clearly there's a lot of misinformation and poor information out there, which is why uh, we're having conversations with ex experts such as yourself so that we can learn a little bit better about, uh, about what's going on and get some of your insights. Um, I thought a useful starting point might be the German economy, since that's clearly an area of great expertise uh, of, of yours. And for many people, it's, it's held up as uh, an example of, of, of an ideal economy or the best economy in Europe. Do you agree with this assessment? No, not at all. Let me, <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me indeed, uh, it's a good starting point. To start with Germany is a good point, because uh, as you said already, everybody now holds that Germany has done everything right in the last 10 years, 15 years, and um, that in particular the uh, belt tightening strategy, the wage, wage moderation strategy, let me call it moderation strategy, we can um, go into that a bit later, the wage moderation strategy was a big success. As such, uh, it was a, s a success, uh, but only under extremely uh, particular circumstances. It was only under the historically unique circumstance of the currency union in the middle of Europe, with Germany as the biggest and the strongest country, that this policy was a success. I think this is this is a crucial me a crucial uh, message. It's extremely important, particularly for unions and other. Uh, labor representatives to understand that message. What has happened in Germany? I can briefly explain, and it's very simple in the end, but you have to look through it. The point is what Germany decided at the end of the, of the 90s already, in 99, 98, uh, to indeed not increase their real wages anymore. Up to that point, Germany was a very normal country where real wages on average of the economy would rise every year with the productivity increase. This was the German formula, and it was uh, even a very successful formula because uh, normal wages did not rise very much uh, above that in Germany, and that is why Germany had a very good inflation performance over the, the decades before, say, three, four, five, even five decades before. German's inflation uh, performance was always good, was uh, superior to the other countries. But at the end of the 90s, so there was quite a bit of desperation, political desperation, and everybody said, including the unions, including the, the leaders of the, of the biggest unions, they said, we have to try out something else. And now what we do is we go for the neoclassical recipe of, so to say, cutting wages. But they did not absolutely cut wages, but they said, we will not increase real wages anymore in line with productivity, but have real wages lagging behind productivity quite a bit. And in the end, it was uh, real wages did not increase anymore in Germany in the last 15 year average, uh, but productivity still increased by, say, something like 1.5% on average every year. So, uh, this uh, experience, so it was, in my view, the, the only one uh, very consequent and consistent uh, neoclassical experiment that has been done by one of the big countries in the world in the last uh, 50 years. And in my view, I explain that now, uh, it was a big disaster. It was a disaster in, in, in domestic terms because domestically it turned out that uh, as flat as real wages were, no, the whole domestic uh, consumption, the whole domestic demand was as flat as real wages were. Because with no income increases anymore, in these years and during the last 15 years, uh, German families did what every reasonable family would do. They cut their expenditure. They cut their domestic expenditure. And uh, that the result was that there was no, no increase in domestic demand, more or less, over these, all, all, the, all of these years. This shows a very important point. This shows an extremely important point and a lesson that has to be learned by everyone if we want to understand what's going on. The point is that the, the traditional neoclassical nexus 
would say, so the traditional neoclassical theory would say, if you cut wages, if you have wages lagging behind productivity to such an extent as in Germany, what would happen is that the production, the, the, the structure of production would be turned around in a way that you would produce at the end of this period much more labor intensive and less capital intensive. And even under certain simple assumptions, you would assume that the cut in wages more or less immediately, immediately is transformed into an increase of employment. And that increase of employment, so to say, would compensate for the loss in, in wages per head. And that would lead to the fact that you do not have, despite the wage cuts per head, you would not have a, a cut in overall domestic demand. If you see, as in Germany, a cut in overall domestic demand, if you see that domestic demand, demand follows the wages, uh, the wages per head, then something is wrong with the theory. And it's fundamentally wrong with the theory, namely, uh, what happened is the wage cuts immediately led to uh, fall in demand, but um, uh, so that the substitution effect never realized, uh, the substitution effect uh, could not realize because uh, companies with uh, falling wages had immediately a fall in, in domestic demand, so they did never uh, think of uh, restructuring their production. So that is extremely important. So, but then there's the second layer, and the second layer is, is very easy to understand. The second layer is that uh, in, in a very open economy, a very competitive economy, Germany was always competitive. If you cut wages, real wages, or you have real wages lagging behind productivity so that your unit labor costs are not rising anymore, or only a little bit, uh, you improve your international competitiveness. You dramatically quick, uh, quickly improve your international competitiveness if, if the other countries don't do the same and if there is no exchange rate that would appreciate. Both was given, as I said, historically unique in the European Union. So in the European Monetary Union, we had two conditions. One was we had an inflation target of 2%. That was clearly violated by Germany, but the others didn't care. Even some went beyond the, the inflation target of 2%. Uh, so only France uh, uh, was the country that stuck clearly to the, to, the, to the 2%. All the other countries in Southern Europe went beyond 2%. They had inflation rates and unit labor cost increases of 2.5%. So Germany, with its 0.5% increase annually in unit labor costs, France 2%, uh, Greece, uh, Spain, Italy with 2.6 or 3% increase of unit labor cost. Well, without any changes in exchange rate, the result is extremely simple and it's in extremely straightforward uh, and uh, everybody will understand it. What happened is just Germany dramatically increased its competitiveness and Germany took market shares from the other countries or expressed it in a different way, Germany exported unemployment. It's mm -hmm. simple like that. Domestically, it was a disaster, and externally, they exported the unemployment. Uh, the only problem, the little problem, to say it in inverted commas, the little problem that we have, that by this policy, uh, we destroyed the economies of our clients. And this, this is where we are. So the wage moderation in Germany was domestically a disaster, a direct disaster, and externally, it's a disaster in the making, as I said uh, recently. It's a disaster in the making because we destroyed the economies of our best clients. So if you have destroyed the economy of your clients, that's not very good policies. It's very unreasonable policies. Uh, and uh, you have to help out your clients at the end. You have to give them the money with which they will buy uh, the goods that you are producing. And that is also not very reasonable policy. And it's not only unreasonable policy, it's, it's, um, it's bad policy because it destroys the, the good political relationship we had in Europe with many countries. And now they're all under the dictatorship, so to say, of Germany and the International Monetary Fund. They're asking them to do crazy things, namely to tighten their belts, to cut budget, to cut expenditure, and to cut wages, which will not work. Because, again, the wage cut will first hit the domestic economy, as in Germany it did, uh, and uh, then only the extra economy. And, uh, because of the big gap in competitiveness, the cutting of wages in Greece and elsewhere will take so long time until they reach the German level or they go below the German level that meanwhile the domestic economies will be totally dead. Uh, so this is the situation in Europe, which is not very reasonable, it's neither for Germany nor for the rest of the world. 
and um, I will stop here and uh, wait for your question. Thank you. Yeah. Herr Flasbeck, to hear the the former vice chancellor in Germany and the head of one of the most important global players in the economy in the UN to give such a succinct and perceptive analysis of the root crisis and causes of what is going on in the Eurozone at the moment is really fantastic for for USI to be able to transmit to a, a wider audience. What's really startling, and for, I was fortunate enough to attend your seminar at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, was this exact analysis that the problem, particularly in the Eurozone, is that wage levels, productivity, and the other countries in Europe, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere, but also France, you know, were at a rate that they were able to pay their wages in line with productivity levels, and Germany did not do that. And this is one of the root causes of the crisis, not sovereign debt, uh, but the, the issue that German wage levels didn't increase at the rate that they should have done, and that now the only option that seemingly is available for European economies is to slash their budgets and cut their wages, which only compounds the problem. How do we get out of the mess that we're in here, Flasbeck? Yeah. Well, you see, the main problem, again, the main problem is, is not, or the problem is not only political. The problem is always a problem also with economists. You see, my colleague economists, uh, that is one of the biggest problems to overcome because uh, every good economist, so to say, under the sun, or say 95% of them, uh, are born and educated with strong belief that the labor market is a market and that the labor market works like a normal market, which is not true, as I tried to show. Uh, and uh, but, but to overcome this strong belief of economists is extremely difficult. And that is where we're fighting at this moment of time. Uh, there are very few economists all over the place, all over the world, I should say, who uh, would share my analysis because they, uh, they still stick to the, to the wonderful idea that the labor market is a, is a normal market, that you, you cut wages, and if you cut wages, you come up with uh, higher employment, so, uh, and uh, that, is, that Germany has done. They, they do not dare to look into, into the uh, different components of the success. They do not fully understand what has gone on, what, what means uh, such a divergence in competitiveness. And uh, so that is, that is one of the big stumbling blocks for, to find a solution. And you see, if economists do not understand it, how can I ask politicians to understand it? And this is the other stumbling block that we have uh, a very uh, well, the political class in Germany has has very much, so to say, uh, um, united behind the view that it's the bad guys in the south and their bad uh, budget behavior that created the problem. Because yeah, it's so nice if if you have such an ex uh, explanation, it, it's very nice. You're not to be, you're not blamed by anyone. You're the big guy. You're the hero, so to say, and the others are the bad guys. So. Uh, that's politically a very nice uh, situation. What you need is a strong movement. What we would need is a strong European movement. What we would need is uh, a clear understanding of the matter, say, in France, Spain, and Italy together, and um, to, to form a, a coalition of, uh, so to say, uh, enlightened people who uh, know better what has happened and then uh, to confront the Germans with that. But that's not happening. If you look at what Spain does, uh, what Spain announced uh, a week ago or so, that they would cut another 65 billion in two years' time in an economy that is for the third year in a recession, is, is really absurd. Can a reasonable per person announce something like that? And, uh, and uh, the same in the country. So even the countries that are under pressure now uh, very much have taken over the German view, the traditional duty. Orthodox German view, and to overcome that is very difficult. France is France is uh, 
uh, not quite clear. The president has not spoken out uh, so clear what, what he thinks and his advisors, I don't know. Uh, there are a number of people, again, in France who fully understand what has happened, but they are few. They, they are not the majority, clearly. And uh, as long as this view that I have presented to you is not, is not the majority view, it will, will be very difficult to political, put political pressure on, uh, on, on Germany and on uh, politicians in general. Herr Flasbeck, another fantastic response. In terms of concrete policy suggestions, it's very obvious that rising wages is a key component of the strategy to help Germany's European partners because they don't have the ability to devalue their exchange rate because they're, they're in the Eurozone. What other policies, concrete policies, do you believe should be contemplated and introduced immediately to help the crisis in the Eurozone, but also beyond, because the rest of the world, as we know, is catching a chill because of what is going on in, in Europe at the moment. We see uh, China, we see Japan, and we see Brazil's economies slowing down, and also America's because of the problem that is emanating from the Eurozone. What concretely can be done? Okay, before I answer the question, let me say two words on the global economy. Um, you see, in the United States, uh, what, what you see there has, in my view, again, this is not the orthodox view, it's very much to do with wages, with wages again. You see, again, you can, you can realize how little traditional economists are willing to take up uh, uh, empirical evidence you can see in the United States. So what has happened in the United States uh, after 2008 was that unemployment jumped from something like 5% to 8% or 9%. But every good neoclassical economist should have, economist should have said at this moment, moment of time, oh, that's impossible because wages have never increased. It, it, the opposite is true. Exactly. Wages have been falling in the United States exactly. for 10 years before that happened. So how can unemployment increase if wages not rising? <laughs> exactly. That's, that's, yeah, it's impossible. Everybody should have said, oh, that's impossible. Something absolutely impossible happened. <laughs> if you have an astrological problem and the, the moon suddenly disappears, every good astrologer would, would say, oh, I have to see what happened now. Yes. Something wrong with my theory. Uh, so, so what is wrong with my theory? An economist doesn't ask that question. Unemployment jumps with wages falling. They say, oh, no, no idea. But the next, thing that they do, the next day after they have slept it over, one night they would say, oh, now wages have to fall. You're sure. Unemployment is high, so wages have to fall. What else? You see how absurd this whole, uh, the whole, the whole situation is. And, but but when, when you have unemployment that is unrelated to wages, and this unemployment, nevertheless, puts enormous pressure on wages, which is clearly politically because the power of the, of the employers rises immediately with rising unemployment. What happened then? Then you get into a very absurd situation, and that is where the United States are now. Namely, you have power, enormous pressure on wages not to increase, but at the same time, the whole economy is waiting for consumption to recover. But how can consumption recover if unemployment is high, if there's no additional employment and wages are not rising? Well, it cannot recover. It, can, exactly. it could only recover if people would still be foolish, again be foolish, one should say in the United States, if people again would be, and reduce their savings ratio because they believe that they have a, a wonderful real estate boom or a stock market boom or whatever boom, what illusion of boom uh, one could give them. But this is all not the case. So what is happening? The United States economy is stagnating because, because wages are not rising. Uh, they have uh, enormous, enormous recovery in profits, companies, but the companies are not investing. Well, why are companies not investing? Because consumption is not rising. Consumption is not rising because wages are not rising. So they're stuck. Huh? They're stuck. As long as they do not have additional instruments of monetary policy, which are not there, or they have additional stimulus from fiscal policy, which politically is not out, so they're stuck. They will be stuck for the next hundred years if they do not understand at a certain point then wages have to rise. And if wages are not rising by market forces, then the government has to instruct companies to increase wages, because otherwise the economy will never flourish. 
it's impossible. Or the United States can wait for someone uh, where they can beggar their neighbor, they can uh, try to, to compete with Europe or with China and trying to gain market shares as Germany did in the last 15 years. And then the whole world will be in a, in a wonderful fight, a fight uh, about uh, competitive depreciation. Who is the best? Who is the best in cutting wages? This is then the competition at the global level. Uh, am I the best weight cutter or not? Or tax cutter or whatever you cut. It's absurd. Huh? At a certain point, it's, it's clearly being absurd because the world cannot cut wages uh, to become competitive uh, against the moon. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> the Venus or the Mars, as long as there are no clients there, you uh, can't, it's useless. <laughs> so... Uh, this is, this is for the global situation. But it's very, you see, it's very important, again, for union movements, it's extremely important to understand these, these uh, relationships, to see how paradox the situation is, and that uh, you have to talk about wages. You have to talk about wages day and night. And uh, a normal economist would, would uh, uh, refuse to talk about wages because normal economists uh, think in terms of the market, the market is perfect, and uh, why do you have to talk about wages? Uh, because if wages fall, it's the best thing under the sun because employment will rise. It's not true. So coming to the Eurozone. So what is, what is the, the way out for the Eurozone? Well, there, there are three, in my view, three elements. One element is absolutely decisive, and that's the element of, as you mentioned it already, of uh, reducing the, the gap in competitiveness. That's absolutely true. But it can only be done over the long term. Nobody can cut wages now, as I said, in Italy or Spain by 20%, what killing the economy there. So you have to do it over time and very slowly. Which, and I would never, I would never recommend cutting wages, but having a slow increase of wages in, in Italy and Spain for, for 10 or 15 years. But at the same time, and this is crucial, a much bigger increase in Germany. So that over 10, 15 years, you have, uh, you have a chance to uh, close that competitiveness gap. If that is not going to happen, then for me, the, the monetary union is dead. Then you will not mm -hmm. overcome, overcome the problems. Uh, the second element is then a complementary element to that. Uh, all the other elements are complementary to that major element. So the second one would be to stop this foolish, this foolish uh, austerity policy. Uh, the fiscal austerity policy everywhere. Uh, it does not reduce government deficit. It does not reach its own targets. This policy is so foolish that it cannot reach even the targets, not, not to, to speak of the pain that it produces, but it cannot reach its own targets. Because uh, if you cut uh, government deficits at a point uh, where, where the private people are also cutting their expenditure, well, the economy collapses, but you don't uh, reduce your government deficit. Uh, but you see, even this very simple, this this simple idea that the uh, the government cannot cut, like uh, in Germany we say the famous Swabian housewife uh, cannot just cut expenditure and reduce their, their overall debt, is is not to be communicated. Cannot be commun uh, communicated in Germany. There are a few economists who try. We're, we're writing articles every day, more or less, uh, about the the whole. Uh, body of politics does not respond. They stick to the idea that you have to cut, you cut, you cut, and then everything. At the end, you come out like phoenix from the ash, which is ridiculous. And we have seen it. We have three years' experience in Greece. We have two years' experience in, in Spain, three years' experience in Portugal. They don't care. They, don't, they don't, do not even listen, uh, do not even look at it. So this is the second element. Stop this foolish policy. The third element is that you would then you need you need a stimulus you clearly need a stimulus from somewhere so rising german wages would be one stimulus but that may be not enough you would need additional stimulus from fiscal policy mainly in germany again or the northern countries but then uh, you need you need additionally you need monetary policy and the role of monetary policy in europe can only be and this is discussed now but it has to be done is to bring down interest rates in Spain and Italy and this, or all the southern countries. Germany, you cannot bring them down them anymore because they're zero already. So what has to be done is a huge program of quantitative easing, whatever you call it, uh, where the ECB directly intervenes to bring down 
the bond rates in, in the southern countries because with uh, uh, six seven percent ten year bond rate you cannot you cannot survive and you cannot uh, consolidate your budget even over the long term. So this is absolutely necessary. Also, and uh, uh, if this is done, uh, then uh, with zero interest rates, with some stimulus from Germany mainly, uh, we could hope that the Eurozone can overcome uh, the recession, can go into a very slow recovery over the years and recover, say, over 10 years, and then the government deficits would be down. Uh, the competitiveness gap would be closed and uh, then there would be a chance for a new start. Now, if you look at it, how realistic that is, uh, you know as much as I do, that is not very re realistic at this moment of time. And that is why I, I have to emphasize that this is my recommendation, but not my outlook. Mm -hmm. Herr Flassbecker, really fa fascinating, you know, to hear your analysis that unless the, the competitiveness gap that you've described in the Eurozone is addressed, then the whole project, that European economic and indeed political project, is in deep, deep trouble. And unless there is a wage appreciation in Germany, then, then if that doesn't happen, then the, the consequences are really dire for the whole of the Eurozone. We've seen recently, Herr Flasbeck, that some powerful unions like IG Metall have secured significant wage rises above inflation in the 4 and 5%. Do you think that there, there is a dawning realisation in Germany that wage levels do need to rise or was this just the result of the strength of the labour movement in order to get those results or is the, is the government in Germany realising that wage levels do need to appreciate? Yeah, thank you. Well, there are always some, even, even uh, the less intelligent people, let me be moderate, <laughs> have some bright moments. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, sometimes uh, in, in some of one of these bright moments, even the German politicians might say that wages should rise. Uh, and they said it sometimes. Yeah. But it's not enough, you see, it's by far not enough. Even what the IG Metall has reached is, is a very moderate increase increase of wages. Yeah. What we would need, what we would need to be very concrete, it's, it's rather simple, uh, is uh, a, an average increase of German nominal wages, of German nominal wages, given the productivity increase of something like one and a half percent, let's say one and a half percent, I think more would be possible, but but let's say, let's be conservative and say one and a half percent, that is what we had in the last, uh, say, eight, ten years. So one and a half percent plus the inflation target in Europe, which is two percent, then you are three and a half percent. You have, at least if you want to have some catching up without the overall deflation in Europe, you have to have a premium on that, which at least should be 1%, so then you have 4.5%. But these 4.5%, that is what uh, me and a colleague, we have related over 10 years, if you calculate that up to the year 2022, and you have at the same time 1% less, nominally less uh, uh, than possible in the southern European countries, so say a country with 2% productivity increase, uh, could have 4% uh, wage increase, but only has 3%, which is 1% less than they, ha they could have normally. Uh, so under these conditions, you get to uh, 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 the wage, the, the divergence, the wage gap, the, the competitiveness gap to be reduced to zero in the year 2022. But, but, the big but to that is that at the point of time, or up to that point of time, you see, due to the absolute advantage that the German companies have because their prices are still lower than in the rest of Europe, they would gain market shares. Up to 2022, even under that uh, scenario, the German companies would gain market shares and the others would lose. So the current account surplus of Germany would still be there, would be high, maybe a bit shrinking, but there would still be a surplus. The other would, others would still be in deficit. 
But the point is, if the others want to reduce their deficits there, their current account deficit, their deficits with the rest of the world, their debt vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, then they have to go into currency, uh, 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 sorry, um, current account surpluses. But to, to have that, to achieve that, you have to go on with that kind of policy, 4.5% normal increase uh, in Germany for, for 20 years. Not for 10 years, but you have to go on for 20 years, and the other countries have to moderate down for 20 years. Then only the gap would really be closed, and the others would have regained some of the market shares in the last 20 years. So this is, this is uh, so to say, a scenario uh, that is not impossible. I don't say it's impossible. But you see, under the circumstances, very unrealistic. If, if Germany's uh, economy is now going into recession, and you hear the first comments already from all angles, including the unions, uh, everybody would say, no, we cannot increase wages anymore. Uh, we have to cut down again. We had our chance, uh, 2011, 2012, but that's over. And we go back to the kind of wage moderation because it was so successful. So either, either we're able the point is very simple and straightforward. Either we're able to, uh, the union movement and those uh, a bit more unorthodox uh, economists, either we're able to convince the European, say, maybe not the majority, but uh, a relevant group of European politicians, that the fundamental change has to be, has to be uh, done uh, in the, in the in, in a due course, in a very, very uh, short time, uh, or uh, the whole project, in my view, is, has no chance to survive. Because what happens now, uh, if the other countries are not successful, the kind of German punishing, German, Germany punishing them and, 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 and pushing them to do more uh, of the unreasonable things, of doing more saving packages and so on, goes on. And in addition, we should not forget what, what in addition, the really sad part of the story, what in addition happens is that due to the kind of um, offensive language, let me be moderate again, the kind of offensive language that some people in Germany are using against the South and the kind of, uh, of really uh, undiplomatic um, and uh, sometimes really, really uh, uh, language that, that should not be used under, uh, under human being, beings at all. Uh, in these circumstances, we get we get a political deterioration in Europe Absolutely. that is much worse than the, than the economic deterioration. What happens is that the tensions build up between the European countries again, that uh, people start to hate other other nations, uh, people start to hate the politicians of other nations. And this is all. This is all extremely dangerous. And this is also, so to say, for me. I just wrote an article in German. I said, uh, well, at a certain point, we have to say the euro is not worth it. If we go on for another ten years, and the German politicians think that they can play the dictators of the other Europeans, that they can uh, tell the southern Europeans that they are lazy and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, well. Uh, not to use other words, that they are lazy people and they are not uh, doing their homework, uh, then uh, the political damage will be so huge uh, that the euro is not worth it. And uh, my conclusion then was that uh, uh, a divorce, a divorce uh, sometimes is then better than to go on uh, to the end, to the very end, where it, where it breaks apart, in, uh, but not only in a friendly way, but in a very unfriendly way. Herr Flasper, that's a very important point because this just isn't about economics, this is about the politics and this is about societies and we're already seeing in certain parts of Europe, you know, a rise in nationalism and in the far right, uh, particularly most worryingly in Greece at the moment where the neo-Nazis, which is what they are, are neo-Nazis, as a result of this climate are gaining traction within certain elements of society, but not just in Greece across Europe. So that's a very pertinent point to me. And we would love to publish that with your uh, consent, that article on our website, because that's the sort of the political and societal dynamic of this is perhaps 
more important than the economics. So we would love to have that article and we can translate that into English and put it on our website. With That would be fantastic if that's agreeable. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to just pick you up on another element. Uh, it goes back a little bit in the conversation, but I think it's a really fascinating point uh, because of your participation in some of the, the economic forums across the world. Uh, and I know when I attended the, the SOAS conference where you said you were the lone voice in many occasions, uh, bearing in mind you were sitting around the table with the World Bank, the World Trade Bodies and the, the IMF. I, would, I think it would be really interesting for our viewers and indeed listeners to give us some of your experience of sitting on these bodies with the other global forums that deal with the economics and trade and their fixation and determination to in introduce everywhere deregulation, privatisation and attack on wage levels and labour unions. So if you, if you could just give us a flavour of your experience in these forums, I think it would be really fascinating. And then, um, have fast back, just to, to add to that, um, what do you see the role of uh, global institutions in, in managing a global economy? Uh, because clearly the, the current institutions are not adequate to the task. Um, so what should we do? what sort of, sort of institution should we be seeking to create to, to manage a global economy? Yeah, these are important questions. And um, as uh, you said, I can only give you a flavor uh, for the moment. But uh, let me give you two or three examples. Well, we have one big topic where UNCTAD has been working on in the past. And we're just writing a policy brief about that. And I hope it will be out next week or so uh, about the so-called financial action of commodity markets. We have uh, the fact of a final financialization of the commodity market established for quite some time. It's absolutely clear that you have uh, uh, quite an influence of uh, uh, financial so-called investors, which are not investors but speculators, uh, on uh, on commodity prices. And we had a big initiative on that. We had a big conference in New York. It was taken up by a personality uh, I uh, evaluate very, very high. It was the president of the Dominican Republic, Leonel Fernandez. He uh, made it his own, his own uh, thing. And he uh, pushed for a big conference that we had in New York in, in May uh, this year about the financialization of commodity. But you see the point again, it's very simple. Uh, we, we have established evidence, we have very strong uh, empirical evidence on that. We have now new evidence on uh, even high frequency trade moving the prices uh, of, of commodities. But it is refused. It is refused by all the other international institutions. They're not willing to talk about it. They're not willing to talk about it and when, when they talk about it, they they, they try to marginalize it. We had a long discussion about that during in the G20 over the, the course of the French presidency last year, uh, where the French president, presidency was very offensive and said, we, we want to discuss it, but uh, in the end it was pushed aside and it had no, no follow-up at all. That's one example. So there is obviously some power from called Wall Street or whatever uh, who are trying to avoid that uh, you talk about this thing, you even talk about it. And there are very few people who really, who really uh, understand what is happening in these markets. And most of these few people who really understand on this market who are non-partisan, uh, they would clearly say, well, sure, uh, you have a huge influence of financial investors. And this is, this is extremely important because it, it distorts the prices in the market. Even good market economists should say, well, this is a disaster if you have financial investors herds herding uh, behavior in the financial markets and these herds of uh, financial investors are distorting the prices. That's a disaster for the market economy. No, but they're silent. They say nothing because it's uh, in, a, in a broader sense the market and they do not want to engage. So that's one example uh, where we have done wonderful work but, uh, but I think we haven't achieved very much and, uh, and where the other, my our sister institutions unfortunately have not uh, taken up uh, the baton uh, they were not willing to, to, to discuss these questions uh, in the open, and uh, we were still uh, struggling to, to go forward. 
The other example is, uh, again, speculation in the financial markets is speculation with currencies. We have very clear evidence, even much more clearer and more <laughs> conclusive evidence that speculation is driving uh, the currencies of, of very important countries like Brazil or other countries like Iceland or Hungary or even the, the right-wing movement in some of the countries like Hungary can be explained by the speculation with the currency which drove the country into a, into a plain disaster. But again, there's not much discussion about it. And again, in, in the G20, the French presidency wanted to make a big topic out of that. Brazil was pushing for that. You see, you know, the uh, Brazilian finance minister some time ago spoke about currency wars uh, because the Brazilian real was appreciated all the time and destroyed the manufacturing industry in, it, in, in Brazil. So, but again, it is not, nobody wishes to talk about it. We have again done a very good work. We have made proposals how to deal with it, how to uh, to get rid of it. Uh, we have made a lot of, uh, uh, we have invested a lot of work in that, but the sister institutions are silent again. We had a big discussion in the WTO in, in March this year, uh, where, you know, to give you just one example, where all the colleagues from the other institutions, International Monetary Fund, World Bank, and OCD, they were asked to, to uh, give testimony on the, on the question how much um, exchange rate movements or speculation uh, distorts trade. And they all said, they came up with a simple with a simple message that said, oh, it's very complicated, you know, it's, it's complex. The whole question is extremely complex. It's difficult to deal with. Uh, so we cannot give you any, any clear um, idea at this moment of time. We have to study it further. So I was asked as the last one to represent UNCTAD and to give my opinion. And I said, ah, you see, it's funny uh, that my colleagues do not know what to say. Uh, if, let's take a simple example, let's take a country like Brazil, by chance, a country like Brazil would have uh, wage increases, no wage increases of say 50% more than all its trading partners. And these 50% wage increases would would drive up the real exchange rate, what we call the real exchange rate, so the competitiveness state would, would destroy the competitiveness of Brazil by something like 50%. What would my colleagues say? Well, they would all say, oh, I know who's the bad guy, who did all the evil, who brought all the evil to the world. Maybe it was the bad unions who drove up the, the, the wages uh, of Brazil by 50%. But if the wages the, in international terms of Brazil are driven up by 50% due to international speculation, because the exchange rate goes up by 50%, oh, we say it's complex. I cannot <laughs> it's very difficult to to judge today what it means. So this is this is the world, <laughs> as I said, just to give you a flavor, I'm going to give more examples, yeah. but these are the most important ones. Okay. Uh, so you said the institution, yeah, let me come to the institution. Yeah, what you need, what you would need is really, uh, first of all, um, a clearly unilateral, uh, a global institution with a global uh, membership uh, and, uh, well, as a UN in, in principle, but it would have to be a clearly non-partisan institution. It would have to be an institution that is really not dependent on political powers on the one hand and on economic powers on the other hand, uh, which is difficult to imagine. It's not impossible, I think, uh, given my experience here at UNCTAD, uh, we had a lot of freedom due to the fact, and you see, as I'm speaking to you, that's uh, free speech, just free speech, nobody restricts me, which is just due to the fact that uh, here in UNCTAD, up to now, uh, the developing countries, some of the big developing countries, including China, I should say, uh, including China, have really fought hard for my freedom to speak, so to say, and uh, I'm very grateful for that, because, um, because for them it was very important to have a second opinion. This is what is important. You can have the IMF and the World Bank and the OECD, that's no problem, I have no problem with that, but you should have a second opinion, which is, uh, has, it gets as much money as the, the first opinion gets to, to give people an alternative. What it's all about, what we're talking about in the world is to have alternatives. Countries need alternatives, people need alternatives. There is no Tina, Tina principle, there is no alternative is the most foolish sentence at all. Uh, there's always an alternative, and this for this alternative you need people to work on, you need institutions to, to fight for, and you need uh, a global uh, discussion. So much more important than one inter international institution would be another 
a big international institution to oppose the others. You see, we're in UNTAD, we're very small. Uh, I have a team here of 10 economists or so, uh, and we're producing, again, a report. Our new report is just coming out. It's about inequality. I recommend it for reading. And um, it covers a number of the topics that I mentioned today. And uh, uh, so, but if you compare us with the World Bank and the IMF, we're very we're, we're tiny. And uh, this should be changed. So everybody, including unions, should fight for for uh, uh, in international institutions that are nonpartisan and big enough to to make a difference. Thank you. Um, Herr Flasbeck, I think we've taken up um, almost an hour of your time, which you've been very gracious uh, in, in giving us. Yeah. Um, I don't have any further questions. I think that's been very enlightening. Andrew, do you have anything else? N nothing. It's been an absolute way, and I'm sure speaking for Walton and I and Union Solidarity International, which is a labour-supported organisation trying to drive forward an alternative that you have just spoken about. There is no such thing as Tina as a, a fantastic way to end this conversation. I think your insight, your analysis and your expertise in this conversation has fully came to the, the fore. And we will be showing this on our YouTube channel, USI Live 2012, and on our iTunes channel for podcasting. And really only leaves me to thank you for your generous time and your fantastic contribution. And what you've said today deserves a wider audience, deserves to be disseminated to the labour movement so that we can fight for stronger institutions to take on the mantra of neoliberalism and the Washington consensus propagated by the WTO, IMF and World Bank. And this conversation has been a very critical part of the conversation that we need to build for the alternative, Herr Flaspeck. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me. And I hope uh, you get a broad coverage and uh, we join together forces uh, today and in the future. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.